And joining us now in studio, Margaret Atwood, author of Payback, Debt and the Shadow Side of Wealth. Hello, it's a pleasure to meet you. It's a pleasure to meet you. We are going to spend the next half hour talking about debt, which you wrote extensively in 2008 in Payback, and it's now being made into a film. When I think of debt, I think when most people think of debt, we think of money, we think of the financial crisis, but you say that debt is about so much more than that. And at the core of all that, it's a mental construct. What do you mean by that? All right, debt is a, is a social interaction, which takes two <laughs> at a minimum. So it takes somebody who lends and somebody who borrows. But the kinds of things that they can lend and borrow are very numerous, and people don't usually think about those. If you go all the way back to chimpanzees, chimpanzees uh, lend and pay back um, back scratches. And they keep track, so it, it's literally true. If you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, <laughs> and I'm keeping count. <laughs> and I remember that you owe me this back scratch. And just as in human hierarchical societies, those at the top get more back scratches than those at the bottom, but there is a trade going on. And debt is really built on this human propensity, which is a social thing, to trade. It is not um, unique to human beings. Other social animals of some kinds do it as well. Uh, but in order to have a social, in order to have a society of any kind, there has to be glue holding it together, and tra uh, lending and paying back is part of that glue. And you look at debt in the book, and subsequently also in the film, it's viewed uh, you know, as a motif of religion, of history, and of the structure of human societies. I want to focus in on one part of your book, which is uh, debt as a motif in literature. And you make the case that, you know, all of us, when we think of Victorian literature, we think of the great and, uh, and fallen romance, the love stories of it. But you say it's really, at its core, about money. So generally, how are these novels about money? Okay, there's a substructure of money in all of them because uh, they are realistic novels. That is, they're not about dragons on another planet. And because they're realistic novels and the people are situated in societies, uh, they have to have a means of support. So who's paying the bills? Where do they get the money that they're paying the bills with? How do they lose the money and find themselves in an indebted position, which is a very 19th century plot? And how do they eventually um, either bail themselves out of that or, or not? And how do, how do such things, in fact, spiral down into tragedy which is one form of literature, or how do they climb the stairs back into comedy happy endings and Elizabeth getting married to Mr. Darcy. So, <laughs> how, how does all of that work? Well, that, how does all of that work? Yes, so there's always, look at any one of them, and you're going to find somewhere in the novel an explanation of how they're supporting themselves. Okay, so let's take a look at Wuthering Heights. Think of Heathcliff and Kathy, great romance, love affair. But you say it's one of those stories that's really about money. Why does Kathy marry Linton and not Heathcliff? <laughs> Why? You're going to tell Does she me. love him more? No. Does Heathcliff have any money at the time when Kathy makes that decision? No. <laughs> uh, so she marries Linton because he's got the house and the fortune. Heathcliff goes off in despair and somehow makes a lot of money. How does he do that? Probably the same way the great Gatsby does in somewhat illicit enterprises. He comes back really quite a lot richer than he went away. We're not sure how he did it, but he did it. And then he proceeds to uh, do the owner of Wuthering Heights out of that person's house and estate. And he does it through money. Gets him drunk, gets him involved in gambling, uh, takes pledges for the gambling debts and ends up owning the house. Then he goes after Kathy again. <laughs> <laughs> You're making it sound all so callous and calculated. It's not, no, it's just the way things were and to a great extent are. And even John Keats, the great romantic poet, said, you know, love in a palace, it's great, but, but love in a hut with nothing but water and a crust, I'm sorry, it's not going to work. And if the, the real test case for all of that is, is Jane Austen. 
because those people are always, yes, they're thinking about, am I compatible, do I love him, all of those things, but they're also thinking about how much a year does he have, and will that be sufficient? These are works of fiction, but what did it say about the time in which they're written, the 19th century, it's, the real? It was very the... accurate, and you read any social commentator uh, of that time, and they're talking about the money market in marriages. So sense and sensibility, he really loves Marianne, but he can't afford to marry her if she doesn't have any money. It's like that, and that's what it was like. Um, Dickens is, a, is another case in point, Great Expectations. Uh, Pip gets turned into a gentleman. Who paid? <laughs> it's a big surprise in the book. Uh, so there is the substructure in all of those novels. Madame Bovary is a case in point. Uh, she would, in fact, have been able to carry on having adulterous affairs till the cows came home <laughs> had she not overspent. Had she not been a shopaholic, Madame Bovary would have come out of it just fine because nobody was noticing. It was when the guy turned up to collect the bills that the whole house of cards was going to come tumbling down. You mentioned Dickin, Dickens and, and Pip and Great Expectations, but you also talk about Christmas Carol and Ebenezer Scrooge and how that reflects the public's mood or attitude about wealth at the time. Um, you know, many of us nowadays in the 21st century are in debt. And maybe we look to Scrooge as smart. You know, his frugal nature was smart. But you say he wasn't actually that smart, that he'd actually made a, a, a pact with the devil. Oh, no, no, no. He, he's... he's uh... Uh, based on another, he, he's cognate with another story in which the guy made an actual pact with the devil. It's implied that Scrooge, um, that Scrooge's affiliations are not with the angels on the Christmas cards. But the real reason why uh, Victorian society would not have approved of him is not that he was rich. Uh, Dickens is highly tolerant of rich people, as long as they're generous. So the problem with Scrooge is the same as the problem with dragons. The dragons amass all of this wealth and then they just sit on it. They don't cause it to circulate. The reason currency is called currency, same like a river, it has to flow. Hmm. So Scrooge sits on his money, he just accumulates it, it goes nowhere. He doesn't even spend it on himself. His moment of redemption is a moment of spending. <laughs> He goes to the window, as we all remember quite famously, and buys a turkey, <laughs> sends it to Bob Cratchit. Okay, he's actually spent some money, and then he does other acts of spending money, but not to the extent at which he bankrupts himself. He continues to be a rich person, but he's circulating his currency, which is the only thing that makes a money system work if the money circulates. Has to flow. Money is a human invention. It's a completely symbolic thing. It doesn't grow on trees, as we're often told. It's not a natural thing. Uh, it's something we made up. We made it up as a convenience. It allows us to trade at a distance. So it then became just so convenient that we turned it into a fetish and we, we made believe that it has an existence apart from us, apart from human beings, it actually doesn't. Something we made up. It's a mental construct. But in order for it to work, um, you have to be able to translate it back into real things. Um, if all you have is money and nothing else, you'll starve to death because you will not be able to translate your money back into food, which is the myth of King Midas. King Midas wished for the gift. And everything he touched would turn to gold. He got his wish careful what you wish for, <laughs> and then he starved because couldn't eat, couldn't drink. It all turned to gold. It's wonderful, all these um, common colloquialisms that you're pointing out that, that we use all, all, all the time that come from these, these stories. People have been thinking about money and what, and what it is and how it's different from trading objects. They've been thinking about that for a very long time. You juxtapose Scrooge with another literary character. It's Dr. Faustus in, in Marlowe's 16th century play. Um, how does Faustus differ from Scrooge in his attitude toward wealth? Well, he's a big spender. And he does make a pact with the devil. In fact, I postulate that, that Dickens took the Faust play, which he would have been familiar with this because it was a popular puppet show in, in the 19th century. So he would have known the story and he reversed it. 
So everything that Faustus is, Scrooge, is the reverse. So Faustus wants youth and, and um, lots and lots of money. And then he's very generous with his money. He does spread it around. He throws big parties. He gives it to people. Uh, he's lavish with his material goods. That doesn't get him points in heaven, however, because he comes from, a <laughs> he comes from an earlier age when being poor was supposed to be a rather saintly thing if, if you had done it on purpose. Uh, so despite his generosity, which is the reverse of Scrooge's, um, he has to get carried off by the devil because he's signed the soul and, contract. And just remind us what happens to Scrooge at the end versus Faustus at the end. Well, Scrooge at the end goes through the three spirits of Christmas past, Christmas present, and Christmas yet to come. And uh, he sees a vision with the ghost of Christmas yet to come of, of himself being friendless, miserable, and dead, and being buried in a in a grave that nobody ever visits, and he, you know, he's a social isolate. He's, nobody loves him, boo-hoo. Uh, and that horrifies him so much that he says, can't I have another chance? You know, is there any way I can change my life? And the spirit of Christmas yet to come doesn't say anything, but dwindles into a bedpost, and then Christ, uh, Scrooge has a moment of, of redemption. He gets extra time. Faustus gets time taken away from him as time has run out. Scrooge gets extra time. If you add up all the hours, he actually gets a whole extra day. And uh, it's Christmas morning, and it's the moment of awakening. All of those, all the symbolism is piled on. And then he gets to go out and do the redemptive good thing of the 19th century, which is, <laughs> I'm buying something. <laughs> What does it say? What does that say about how wealth was viewed at the time when these novels were written? Well, I think people knew that in order for society to cohere, money had to circulate. And there's been a lot of chat recently about the top 1%. Um, and when the top 1% does control too much of the wealth, it has a stagnating effect on the rest of society because the money cannot circulate freely enough, and um, when money is circulating, the good way in which it circulates is that it begets more. Uh, but if it ceases circulating at all, then it's not going to work, it's not earning anything, it's not um, you know, paying for things that people... It's not worth it. it well, it's, it ceased to be a medium of exchange, which was what it was invented for. You're not exchanging anything, you're just sitting on it. There's also a difference in the from the 16th century to the 19th century, so from Marlowe to Dickens, in, in terms of the Protestant Reformation took place. And, and did that have a huge impact on how we viewed wealth and debt? Oh, I think so. Um, I think there was a moment in the uh, 17th century amongst the Puritans, in which a particular verse of the Bible um, got interpreted in a way that was different from the way it had been interpreted before. And it is this verse. By their fruits ye shall know them. Okay, so who said that? Well, it was Jesus. What did he mean? He meant actually spiritual fruits. Uh, but if you take that to mean material fruits, uh, <laughs> fruits <laughs> taken rather <laughs> widely, it means rich people are good. <laughs> In other words, if you're rich, you must have been favored, and, and therefore you're good which is the exact opposite of how medieval times viewed such matters when um, Lazarus uh, looking down upon Dives burning in hell was quite a popular subject. Lazarus having been poor on earth and Dives having been rich. So it was a flip-flop. Mm. Um, the medieval church, of course, encouraged a certain kind of poverty you got poor by giving your money to them. Um, so there was, was someone instigated, but ne nevertheless, the view of, of wealth became quite different. And, and fast forward to today, to 2012, do you think authors would have been so hard on Faustus uh, for being a big spender nowadays? Nowadays, authors. I don't think Marlowe was being hard on Faustus for being a big spender. Um, I think having endless amounts of it was easy for him to spend because he had the endless supply. Um, so 
the point of his money is is that it was um, it was infernally gained, and therefore it never ran out as long as he was alive. If you read enough fairy tales, you will encounter this theme. <laughs> I've read many, many, yeah, with so the you young child, read many fairy one. tales. Yeah, so Aladdin's <laughs> cave, etc. I mean, you can always go get, you can just go get more. So it's not, it's not that Faustus was spending money that was going to cause any hardship to himself. Uh, what the Christian church in medieval times really liked was when you gave away your last widow's might, when you ripped up your cloak in two and gave, gave it to beggars, etc. Uh, so something that cost you, it cost you an effort. You also took a look as a debt as motif in literature. You also look at it through the lens of the female protagonist. And you talk about Vanity Fair, uh, written 1848, I think. Um, and the character of Becky Sharp, as she works her way up, the social ladder by marrying uh, Rod and Crawley. So what do Becky's actions reflect about um, the idea of owing and being owed and that relationship between husband and wife during that time? Well, Becky is an adventurous. Uh, there's a later 19th century figure written by um, Edith Wharton in a book called The Custom of the Country. Her name is Undine, Undine Sprague. And she really marries from man to man. Becky only marries one. Undine, Undine marries a series and does each one of them in in some way and collects <laughs> their money, moves on to the next. So these are adventuresses. And they marry specifically to better their own position um, and gain wealth, which a lot of men did too. So that's why there are all of these stories in the 19th century about the heiress whose dad is suspicious of fortune hunters. So in Vanity Fair, it's not just Becky. Amelia is about to get married to this promising young man, and her dad goes bankrupt. And the promising young man wants very much to throw her over. And his dad wants him to throw her over, but his best friend holds him to his bond of honor, and he marries her. Um, that whole money-marrying money thing is, is very, very apparent in, in Vanity Fair. Now, Rod and Crawley, she, she wished once she finds out that the richer, older son wanted to marry her, she's, she's really annoyed because <laughs> she's already married the younger son. Uh, but having married him, she, she schemes to help him uh, cheat and steal. And who they cheat and steal from specifically is tradesmen. So they put on a great show of having money. And we know this. We've, we've watched pyramid scheme builders and Ponzi schemers. And they always put on a show of being wealthy, and this is what the uh, Rod and Crawleys do, and then tradesmen um, supply them on, on spec. You know, they send me the bill later. So they send the bill later, and it ne never gets paid. And then they change addresses. And in the, in the trickle-down effect of debt, it's these small tradesmen who get ruined, whereas the Crawleys swan on to the next set that they're going to defraud. I, li I liked what you said in the Massey lecture that, you know, we talk about it being a trickle down, but I think you made the analogy, it's not a gushing waterfall. The trickle down of wealth is not a gushing wa waterfall, and we do not talk about the trickle down of debt, which is equally real. So if I owe you money and I don't pay you, you can't pay her, and she can't pay him. It so is, it's, a, it's a chain reaction. It's a commentary on the gap between rich and poor to an extent. Well, because, well, the Crawleys aren't actually rich. They, their, their wealth is virtual. <laughs> it's, they've made it up. They act rich and dress rich and eat rich, but they don't actually have any money. So the other, the people they're defrauding do. They have s small amounts, but they have um, uh, small margins, <laughs> like, like book selling. So then any effect <laughs> on those is pretty catastrophic for them. In some of the cases that you, you talk about, um, you say the women might have done a little bit better had they known more, and about, more about debt management, that their lives wouldn't have ended so tragically. Well, that's true of Madame Bovary. Um, it wouldn't have helped um, Maggie and Mill on the Floss very much because she wasn't in charge of any money. It's her, her dad lost the money through uh, lawsuits that he didn't win. 
Uh, so fi women in that position were, were really pretty much at the mercy of their, their families. They didn't have a means of livelihood. Why are there so many governesses in 19th century fiction? Because it was the only thing an educated woman could do. She didn't have any money. What about Lily, uh, Lily Barth? How's Lily Barth is a very tragic case because she is another person, and this is in Edith Wharton's The House of Mirth, um, Lily, Purity, Bart, object for trade. Uh, her best bet would have been to have made a good marriage, but she doesn't have money. So she lives in society, you know, expensive society, but she doesn't have the wherewithal to live in it. So what's she gonna do? What is she going to do? She could have made a rich marriage, but because of the lily part of her nature, she can't bring herself to marry that particular man. And when she finds that society is ejecting her, she has no means of livelihood. She, has, she doesn't know how to make a living. She goes to work for a hat maker, a milliner, but she's no good at it. She hasn't had the training. She doesn't have a job she can fall back on which is why so many girls in the mid-50s went out and learned typing. <laughs> At least they would be able, you know, if all else failed, they would be able to get a job as a typist. You also talk about um, the ruin for women wasn't bad, as bad financially as it was if they were women who had problems of sexual ruin. And that, well, no, the word meant both things. Okay, for women specifically, it meant sexually ruined. Um, for, for men specifically, it meant financially ruined. You could be ruined financially as a woman. It was very hard for you to be ruined sexually as a man. Almost impossible, unless you were gay. So Oscar Wilde got ruined <laughs> through being gay. But uh, for women, they could be involved in, say, a disastrous divorce, as Becky Sharp ultimately was and then they have to go and live on the continent because they will not be accepted into good society. They pay back their debt in a different way. Um, probably never exactly gets paid back because not all debts, of course, are paid back, <laughs> as we know. Over time, um, what factors influenced how the role of debt in fictional stories changed? Well, that's a very big question. Since when? Well, since let's go from the from the Victorian novel, let's look forward from there. I mean, how wh what change did time. we see? Which, which decade would you like to pick? Well, bring us bring us into the twentieth century. The 20th century. <laughs> uh, well, the big money novel is probably the Great Gatsby, in which um, the hero, um, Mr. Gatsby, falls in love with Daisy because she represents this amazing ideal, which includes being very rich. Um, she doesn't marry him. He doesn't have any money. She marries Tom. And they live inside a charmed money castle out of which Daisy ventures to have a little fling with Gatsby. Uh, but that doesn't work out very well because he's too honorable. He gets killed in her stead. And uh, she just retreats behind her money again. So that's one... Um, one person who's dealing with it, I would say the other writer who deals with it quite a lot is, is E.L. Doctorow, especially in novels such as Loon Lake. Uh, what about lots and lots of money gained in dubious manners, uh, which is one of the themes of America, of course, and what is uh, a lot of the films, a lot of the stories, The Godfather, you know, it's, that's what it's about. It's about making money through criminal activities and how that society is structured. Nowadays, we're going to fast forward some more. You know, there are a lot of nonfiction books out there about debt and about managing debt and about getting out of debt. Are there novels now that are really reflecting our attitudes towards wealth in the same way that, that you argue that 19th century novels did? I think those novels will be written shortly by children whose parents were involved in the 2008 crash. So it's when there's a change, a change in fortunes, uh, and young people are involved at an impressionable age that you later get novels written about that. For instance, Charles Dickens, his father was a Mr. Micawber type who was always running into debt, and he got put into the Marshalsea debtor's prison. 
which meant that young Charles was pulled out of school and sent to work in a blacking factory, which uh, was at the age of 10, which was a very um, deeply impressive event for him. And his subsequent work is, is filled with people who have money problems, uh, filled with um, cr criminal elements, you know, dubious, dubious characters. Uh, this, this was a formative event for him, and it was caused by his dad's bankruptcy. Why do you think it's important to look at the issue of, land, uh, of debt through the lens of literature? Because it's, um, as I say, it's a human interaction. It's, it's part of the stories that we tell, and to separate it from our human and social lives is to fetishize money and uh, pretend that it has a real existence of its own, you know, separate from us. In other words, it is to make it into a god, which the last time I looked was called idolatry. <laughs> so, so unless you see it as part of, as, as something human beings invented and part of human interaction, you're fetishizing it and turning it into a god. Maybe some good advice as we deal with a world economic crisis to keep these things in mind. I don't know whether it's advice, it's just kind of the way things are. The way things are really when you peel back all the verbiage that's plastered on top of them. Margaret Atwood, what a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for coming in today and talking with me. And thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.